It's very nice to see you, uh, Mr. Javid. Thank you very much. Um, it's really good. Um, and, uh, and we want to say that we were pleased at the announcement um, that uh, charges were going to be removed um, from the applications for settled status by European citizens living in this country. Um, can I just start, for the benefit of the general public, and, and it's familiar territory for you, I know, but of course um, um, we want everyone to know that this is a session that's open to the public. A webcast of the session goes out live um, and is subsequently accessible via the parliamentary website. A verbatim transcript will be taken of the evidence and will be put also on the parliamentary website. A few days, you know all of this, but a few days after um, this evidence session, you'll be sent a copy of the transcript to check for accuracy, and we would be grateful if you could um, advise us of any corrections as soon as possible. And if after this session uh, you want to clarify or amplify any points made in the course of this session, um, or you want to add anything, uh, you're welcome, of course, to do so, and to do so by way of supplementary written evidence. Um, uh, so, um, can I just um, then um, start by saying that we were um, rather relieved to see that the funding um, issue had been resolved um, uh, favourably for those who were making application. And I just, um, I just wanted to start by saying that the initial advertising that was put out by the Home Office was, um, for settled status was very heavily criticised. Um, the editor of the Spectator magazine described the tone as disgusting. This wasn't what some wild left-wing magazine saying it. It was the Spectator magazine. And the Financial Times published an article which described the scheme as Orwellian. Now, when you appeared in front of this committee in June of last year, you agreed that the Home Office messaging should seek to embrace EU nationals in the UK. And in those circumstances, we really want to ask you, why did the advert start by saying, if you are an EU citizen living in the UK and want to stay in the UK after December 2020, then you know, this is how to do it. Um, and we really wanted to know, did you sign off personally on that advert? So, uh, thank you, uh, Baroness Kennedy. So I'll, I'll come to that question. If I may just make a couple of remarks uh, at the start. Uh, uh, on this. I mean, uh, first of all, thank you for welcoming the change in the fee arrangements. I would like to say it was in preparation of me appearing in front of your committee, but there were some wider considerations as well. Frighten you so much. <laughs> Look at the impact you're already having. Um, but uh, again, um, just as I appeared in front of your committee before, I want to say thank you for the invite and the scrutiny uh, that you provide to this and, and many other issues. I do very much uh, welcome that, especially on this all important issue of uh, citizens' rights, EU citizens' uh, rights that are here in the UK. But as we know, and you've just alluded to, many of them understandably may be concerned about what the future is, what it holds, whether it's deal or no deal, and hopefully we can go through much of uh, that today. But I just want to also say uh, again at the start, and I, I said it soon after I became Home Secretary, is that I, we, the, the, the UK government in its entirety, hugely values the contribution of EU citizens uh, that, they, that they have made in the past, continue to make uh, to the UK, every single one of them. Uh, they are, in many cases, part of our family, clearly part of our society. They make economic contributions, uh, uh, cultural contributions in so many uh, countless ways that I think is invaluable. Uh, what they provide to our country. And that's why we've set out, and hopefully we'll learn more about it today, is to have a system in place that, first of all, is absolutely clear whether there's a deal or there's no deal, in all eventualities that we not just uh, we want them to stay, we very much uh, want them to stay, therefore we want to make it as easy and as straightforward uh, as possible. Uh, and that cuts to the issue around cost as well, for example, so I'm glad that the government was able to uh, make a move on that. Uh, but that is very much the sort of um, the, uh, our position as we as we look into this. That which then brings me on very specifically uh, to your uh, first question uh, about the uh, advertising. I think the social media advert you referred to in uh, December. Uh, your your, your the, the latter part of your question was: uh, Did I sign off specifically on that advert? I didn't see that advert in in, in advance, that particular one. Uh, but I have no problem with it, and let me explain why. Uh, despite what, uh, how it was re received in some uh, quarters. And the reason is simply this, that you uh, will know, uh, the, uh, Baroness Kennedy and, and, and members of the committee, the reason I am Home Secretary is because of the Windrush 
problems. That's why I am Home Secretary. And I remember and so well the, the way in which we received with such enthusiasm what you said when you came, because you said very um, powerfully that you were going to change the culture inside the Home Office, that you were going to absolutely make sure um, that, uh, the, that the whole atmosphere um, would be very different and that on this and that that couldn't ever happen again and that on these issues that you would be embracing the needs of those people who came to this country. And that's, that's exactly right and I hope uh, again I, I've just set out exactly what I think and I think the whole department thinks of our EU friends that are, that are settled in this country and uh, how we very very much want them to stay and how we want to make it as easy as possible. But turning back to that advert and the reason I mentioned the Windrush uh, problems is that I am acutely conscious of what went wrong with Windrush and as I've uh, said before in Parliament and select committees is that the, when you look and, and we continue to learn the lessons we've got a proper sort of independent lessons learned uh, work being done as well but one of the most obvious lessons is that there were there was a mistake uh, by under successive governments that goes right back to the change in their status of those individuals that had settled here from the Commonwealth which like the EU uh, citizens today were uh, legally here, had every right to be here, but they were not at that time you know, British citizens. They were here under the citizenship of, let's say, a Caribbean Commonwealth country. And when the Immigration Act of 1971 was passed and changed their status, nothing was done by the then government and subsequent governments to document the change in their status. And, uh, and I, I mean, who knows why it wasn't done? I think it's probably a perfectly innocent thing that no one really thought it might in the future turn out to be a problem. But clearly it turned out to be a massive uh, problem when many years later, uh, starting in the uh, 2000s but continuing uh, in recent years, is that uh, we have seen under successive governments and we found out through the um, historical review of those affected, those most affected by uh, in, in, with the Windrush situation, that almost half of those the, uh, that were affected the most was, uh, were under uh, the government before 2010 and, and uh, many later as well, but under successive governments. And the core of that problem, there's many more, but the core was they weren't documented, they were not properly documented, that was a fault of the authorities, no fault of the individuals at all. And we cannot have such a situation again. And there is a real parallel with where we are today. So right now, here today, we have the opportunity as this government, all of us as legislators, to make sure that we learn the mistakes of the past. And what that means is for the EU uh, citizens that are here today, that we properly document their status. Because whether we like it or not, when we leave the EU, as I say, with a deal, no deal, at some point, they would have to have proper status so that they have no problems in the future to live here, to work here, to continue their lives here, for their children to continue attending schools, to access public services. And that does require proper documentation because we cannot have a situation in the future that we are not able to identify between the cohort of three million plus that were here before exit from the EU or at the end of the implementation period if we have a deal um, and, and you know, uh, new EU citizens that continue to arrive uh, for, uh, you know, under new arrangements after that. And that does require them to register. Now here's the challenge in that if you don't send out messages that make it clear that you do need to register, you do need to take part in this process, the risk you run is that people feel there's not much pressure on them, they don't have to do this, and over the couple of years of the registration period, they don't bother registering because they never felt the pressure. So there is, I agree, that there's a balance to be struck. But, you know, for those who uh, sort of criticise the advertising and the message, and you read out the message, uh, I'm afraid I don't have it here with me, right, but I think you said, if you are an EU citizen and you want to stay... If you can want yeah, to stay in yeah. the UK after December the 2020, yeah. Yeah. you must... Put up. And that is the correct message. Now, that is a, it's a factual message which is saying, please register, because if you don't register, the risk is that we have another wind rush, and I am not going to allow that to happen on my watch, and that's why I think it's absolutely, we've obviously got to be sensitive, we have to do it the right way, but we have to be clear that the purpose of this scheme is that we avoid problems in the future. I, I, I understand that, and I think the question mark was around the tone, but I'll, I, I would like Baroness Sha uh, uh, Shackleton to Home Secretary, that. thank you for that explanation. Um, I remember very vividly your evidence before us in June when I said to you, can you not change the emphasis from 
we'll be lucky, you'll be lucky if we keep you, to welcome. And you told us that you were the descendant of a bus driver and you felt very welcome. I'm a descendant of somebody who sifted rags many, many years ago, and I've always felt welcome. And I completely understand that for the avoidance of a repeat windrush, it's essential these people do it, which is a mechanical registration like collecting a passport. I absolutely understand that. But I think what has been lost is the emphasis of you are guilty until you sign off on this form which will rectify that as opposed to we are delighted to have you could you please just sign the form to avoid any problem in the future and this business of doing people a favour who are doing this country enormous favours by contributing in all the ways you've just suggested from builders to doctors to um, just a whole range of people who we rely on in this country and have given much more than they've ever taken out to feel that we, the establishment or the people who are doing this effectively census, are in some way interrogating them for the purpose of making them feel lesser. I think we should be grateful to these people and acknowledge their contribution and presume that they're here legitimately, but could they please fill us in to make sure that at future times we avoid a problem? And when the £65 was taken off the table, that, to me, would have been a fantastic opportunity to make some mileage out of that, to say we, we recognise that it isn't right for legitimate stayers here to have to pay, and therefore we are not going to, in the future, do it, and maybe suggest that the people who have already paid have that money refunded as an acknowledgement, because people are generally quite impressed with people who say, sorry, either to yourself or to a nominated charity, and then the government could choose six cha charities and they could stick in a box, because if I was somebody who would paid the £65, I would be very upset now not to get it uh, have some recognition but I was trying to do what I was asked to do and I did it quickly so there are two things here one is can we please do something to make the people who are tying the urgency and the imperativeness of doing it with recognition that this is not an insult because they are doing us a favour mm. yeah. uh, th th thank you and um, th I agree with everything you just said Baron Shackton. And so I think that, I mean, first of all, uh, EU citizens that are here, I agree, actually, I like your language as well, that you know, they're not doing us a favour. So we're not doing them a favour by this. They are doing us a favour already by having come to Britain in the first place and and uh, and doing what they do, whether it's the it's the adults that are working, the children that are, uh, I think, culturally enriching our own children and things. So I think it's uh, they're very much part of our community. And uh, and I know we're not talking about the immigration white paper today, but since uh, I last met the committee, we also published the immigration uh, white paper in, uh, just last month. And in, in, in there, in the, both in the, in the forward, the way we presented it, and I've talked about it, including in Parliament, is very much about you know this country is proud of its history of uh, immigration and how it has enriched our country, whether they are Europeans or whether they are my parents or uh, your family or others. And so, and I think that's very important uh, for us going thank forward. Thank you. Anywhere on it? Sorry? Does this form say thank you? Anywhere? The form? Yeah. Which form, sorry? The form that they asked to complete. We're grateful to you for having to complete this form. We're grateful you for having I, completed I, I, this form. Um, yeah. We... Um, we're hmm. grateful to you for your contribution. Please fill it up to avoid problems in the future. The, the tone of it, which I had great faith after you were like a breath of air, came in sorts in June, doesn't seem to have found its way down into the actual well, the, form. The, the, when you say the, the form, the, the, the process for most people, maybe we go into a bit later, it's a, it's a, for most people, it doesn't have, there are options for people, but it will be an online process, yeah. and that's what our testing is showing. And it is very what I describe very user friendly, very forward leaning and and and, uh, the, and and I think the tone is 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 correct. It's not do it in the first place when they've contributed as opposed to yeah. it doesn't seem to me to have got through, which is why all those Twitter messages and the spectator decided that this wasn't very welcoming. Well, I think the, app, the, the process itself is, is very, what I would say, uh, friendly in its approach. And obviously it should be and it absolutely should be. And I have, I've seen it my, myself. 
Um, but also, you mentioned uh, Barry Shackleton, the, uh, the the decision the PM announced yesterday on waiving the fees, and she said precisely what you've just suggested. She, so first of all, she she obviously announced the decision, which I think was absolutely correct and very welcome. She talked about one of the reasons that the government has decided to do this is because it's re reflected and, 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 and thank people, uh, the, the EU citizens here, for their contribution, their continued contribution. She said again, as she, and I think we've got to keep saying again and again, whether we have a deal or no deal, it makes no change uh, to your rights. Uh, and she also said in her statement, that if you have already paid the fee in, your, um, uh, in the, some of the testing, it will be refunded in every single case. So she said that as well. So some of that message has all, already gone out. And what we will be doing, given it's only been announced yesterday, is that we are already having a comms uh, process put in place to make sure that we emphasise that all with the right tone. I'm going to move on from this, but I, it, it, I think that really what Baroness Shackleton is saying is that, is that the appearances that the, the, the charge has been removed because of the criticism you've received and if only um, it had been done in the way that had been suggested here and that you had agreed you would oversee um, as we went forward. So it, it is, a, it is a, a pity. But I'd like to take us on. Um, uh, Baroness uh, Neuberger, um, you had a matter yes. to raise. So we've seen the online outreach. But what other steps has the Home Office taken to advertise the scheme to EU nationals resident in the UK? And again, we talked about this with some of your officials back in July. And we're very concerned about people who are not uh, comfortable online, who don't have access to online. Uh, we're sort of thinking about, you know, people who are now grandmothers or indeed great-grandmothers who were Italian immigrants running cafes. But there are any number of examples we could give you. What work has been done and what work, just following on from Baroness Shackleton, what work has been done to make these people who've been in the country probably for 60 years yes. feel really welcome? Yeah, you're absolutely right to raise that and I think we touched on it a bit uh, before. And um, the, uh, what we, we have what we call a, uh, a comprehensive strategy in place for uh, vulnerable citizens, less uh, or citizens that are, that would be uh, less, uh, let's say, less up to speed on um, the, using apps and technology uh, of that type. So what we have done, and there's a number of parts of this, but one of the main things we've done is that we set up a user group of external stakeholders, a lot of uh, charities, NGOs, uh, groups that represent some of the European citizens. We've brought them uh, together to, first of all, take their advice, but to make sure that we don't miss anything. So, for example, uh, some of it might be targeted on um, uh, elderly people, some of it might be targeted on disabled people, some of it might be targeted on people that don't speak uh, English uh, well enough. And uh, we've also dedicated funding to this. So, so far, we dedicated £9 million of our budget that will be support, grant based support to external groups that we think, in some cases, will be better placed to get through uh, to uh, some of these uh, more vulnerable uh, citizens. And so we'll be working with these organizations, utilizing their networks, we'll be providing them uh, funding. And, uh, and I guess in terms of how, what type of help they get depends on uh, d to the extent that they, what kind of um, uh, um, support they might need. So for example, so what we've already uh, uh, looked at is that there are some people that say that it wants the, once we uh, uh, get in touch with them, we expect the reaction will be that they don't have either a mobile or they're not that comfortable doing it themselves. So we will suggest to them, in that is, we can say that we, we have places across the country, especially in the libraries, that will be set up with a, with a, a dedicated uh, space to, uh, to go through the application process. So we can guide them there. There'll be someone there to help them, and that might be sufficient. But in some cases, uh, obviously, there's a bit, there's a bit of a hotline, so you can, someone maybe can guide you through the process that if you have your own device. Um, and in other cases uh, where people um, uh, can't do that, perhaps let's say an individual is disabled in some way and is not able to have to go somewhere and it's better if someone comes to them, in those cases we will make sure that someone actually goes to them and visits them perhaps even in their own home. That's great, but the ads have already gone out, if you like, for people doing it online. So some of those people will have heard about this. They'll have family members who are younger or whatever. So where is the information in, that we might have seen, for instance, in community newspapers and newsletters or whatever now that goes, if you like, con concurrently with the online process for those people? Because that so seems we, to me to be missing. That's good, but we have an advertising campaign. Maybe Glenn will talk about that, specifically on that. Mr. Williams, yes. so maybe you can um, fill, fill some of the gaps. I mean, 
Firstly, just on the communication you, re you referred to uh, before Christmas, I mean, that, the tone of that was not meant to be threatening, it was meant to be factual, because we had a lot of feedback from the user groups that EU citizens actually want hard facts from us as to when they need to apply, how they need to do it. So, okay, we had some negative feedback on that, um, so we apologise for that. I apologise on behalf of the department if we got the tone slightly wrong, but obviously we would, we would not intending it to be in any way in any way threatening. Now in terms of communications, I think it's important to remember that we haven't actually fully started yet. Um, we've done two private beta phases in the autumn and just yesterday we started the public beta phase and the scheme is fully open, will be fully open from the 29th of March. So um, I mean we didn't want to do Obviously, if we, if we do too much advertising before the thing is open, then we will be jumping the gun, as it were. Um, so we intend to ramp up the, the breadth and depth of the communications um, as we move through, through this year, actually. Um, the communications uh, will not simply be through social media or online. Um, we're also intending to um, use posters in transport hubs or key city locations, uh, especially where we think there are high numbers of EU citizens. Um, radio advertising on local and national radio stations, um, something called video on demand across digital TV channels. Um, so there will be a mixture, and, and social media as well, obviously. So we will be aiming for a, a variety of different um, channels of communication. Um, Baroness Ludford. Yes, um, thank you, Home Secretary. I mean, you, um, in your introduction, you talked about the rationale of the settled status uh, <coughs> scheme um, uh, was partly motivated by the experience of the Windrush uh, problems when um, those uh, citizens were not properly documented, and you talked about learning the mistakes of the past. But um, as I understand it, perhaps you could clarify whether this is the case, that individuals who are granted settled status will not get any documentation to prove their right to residence in the UK. So, um, I mean, if they want to, you know, get a job, open a bank account, rent a flat, access medical services, so I understand that what they get is a, is a reference number... What does a landlord, for instance, do? They contact the Home Office with a reference number and, and, and they, they get something, something back? Um, uh, would you, I mean, how really, um, and, and let's say, you know, governments can change. Let's say a future government said we're going to change the system, make, have a new scheme where people have to reapply, and they've got absolutely nothing. I, I mean, the... the, 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 the Contention seems to be that, you know, everybody lives in the cloud these days. But, um, I mean, for things like a passport, driving licence, a marriage certificate, a birth certificate, people have a piece of paper, perhaps the only things where they absolutely need to keep paper. In the light of Windrush, wouldn't it be sensible for people to say, I want a piece of paper that evidences my successful claim for settled status? Um, perhaps you could tell us, I mean, I can't remember whether people who went through the permanent residence process, um, which didn't have a long life, I don't know whether they got a piece of paper, but for those who, who apply for settled status who already went through permanent residence or some other kind of status, um, and I think your, the, the, the report on the, uh, the second phase pilot talked about um, confusion um, some people, uh, you know, there was confusion between a registration certificate or residence card issued under the EEA regulations, which looks very similar to a permanent residence document. And almost a 1,000 people mistakenly believed that they had documented PR status or existing ILR. Isn't there a great potential for confusion in these circumstances? And a very clear piece of paper which says exactly what people's status is would be helpful. I'm sure that the Secretary of State has got the point. So, so thank you. So um, it, it is a, uh, as you uh, alluded to, it is a digital uh, status system as opposed to a physical status system. 
Um, so that to be clear, so your status is once you've gone through the process, it's recorded uh, electronically. But it is a permanent record that the, the Home Office will have uh, of that uh, individual and all their family members and, and, and their actual status. Of course, you don't need, the, the, you have until, depending on deal, no deal, about how much time you have to, uh, uh, to uh, register. But it is, it is part of trying to make this uh, system as straightforward and as quick and as simple to use as possible. And so at the end of the process, once you receive a confirmation, you will get a unique reference number, and that reference number will, uh, will um, both be secure, it will be a permanent record. You ask whether um, employers, for example, can access that. That is exactly what happens uh, today. Uh, for when employers uh, uh, perform checks and right to work checks, which they do on everyone, um, and uh, they will be able to uh, access that system. It's an online uh, system, and and we don't foresee any reason why that system absolutely c uh, cannot work. But what you've said also is that they they absolutely there may well be some people that that say that think that you know, they need to have a a, a piece of paper. Uh, that proves their status. I mean, of course, there's nothing, uh, an individual, if they really want to have a piece of paper, the electronic proof that they get, uh, they could absolutely just print that out, use it, keep it as extra security, whatever, but they're not going to need that. It is an electronic-based uh, system. Oh, Secretary of State, mm. I love your confidence. Your, co mm. yeah, your confidence in, in you know, we, we know that one of the things that we're fearful of as we go forward is cyber attack. The ways in which um, uh, systems can be taken down, it's going to be one of the ways in which there's going to be a waging of destruction um, um, by, by um, foes of the nation. I mean, you know, I, 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 even accidentally, I mean, I, 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 mean you, I, was, I was so interested that you used the expression, Windrush taught, taught us that you, we can't have people being non-documented and we can't have it again. Document, uh, you have to document the change in somebody's statement. And the word document, you know, I mean, I suppose we could now in the modern world say document doesn't mean document. But, I mean, um, people like to have something solid. And I, I really do think, I mean, I for one would, um, and I, people will say, well, so that's because of your age. But I, I, uh, I suspect that my children too, and I would be advising my children, get the bit of paper so that when they say to you, but our system doesn't say that, you can say, I'm, I'm sorry, just take a look at this. And you have been sent through the post. I can't see why some of the billions that are being spent on this couldn't be spent on creating a document that is then sent to people um, uh, so that they can have something confirming their status, that they keep in their file of precious documents with their birth certificate, their marriage certificate, and it will be waiting for their you know, settled status certificate. Can I just want yeah. one more additional sub-question to that? You're assuming that the employer has access to technology. An old lady wanting a carer, what does she do about somebody arriving in her house saying, I'm fine, I'm ticketed? She doesn't have a computer. There are people, I know we're dinosaurs, not we, but they, we may consider them dinosaurs, but these people exist. And it's precisely to avoid them being hoodwinked by people that they need something tangible to look at, which is simple and straightforward. I understand that not everybody will want a piece of paper, but surely can't there be an option that if they do want one, they can have one? Indeed, I think they will need one. If you think about the example of the carer, the person who's coming to be the carer has to show a DBS certificate, which is sent out and is a piece of paper. Shouldn't the same apply? Because the old person who needs the carer needs to see both. I mean, this shouldn't be seen as just about old folk, you know, um, and, and, and everybody's going to roll their eyes about, about the non-techie savvy person. Um, because, because many employers will say, I want to see your passport. And that's what's happening now. People say, I want to see the passport. Um, and, uh, and that will happen in all kinds of organisations. And so I, I, I do think that you're missing a trick on this. Um, does, and I, I want to t move us on. Um, can I, uh, Earl of Canoe, please? Sorry. Sure. Oh, you haven't had the chance to answer. Are you? Uh, you know? I will. I'm <laughs> sorry, if I may, just very quickly uh, on that. As how we how it should be done, um, and we're sort of saying that. No, I, I hear you, and I, I want to. If I can just take a minute, yeah. and maybe Glenn just want to take a, a few seconds. As well, is that it is the, you know just to take the example. Of, uh, I think you used the example of a, a carer and someone wants to see the status. Remember, documents can be forged as well. 
right? So documents can be forged. This is a, you know, it's, it, they're, they're, there's no, there are challenges either way, whether you're a paper system, a, a, an electronic but, but, system. Like this, but you can say, to, you hand over to the employer the inverted commas forged document, hmm. but you can then hand it to somebody saying, can you check this for me? There's nothing there for them to check. But, but, but fine, but they could also ask someone to, if, if you've got your electronic digital reference number, they could also ask someone to check that as well. Yes. So my, 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 I'm not, I, I understand the argument about documents thing, but it is, it is the case, I think, I mean, over time, whether it's, uh, we're obviously talking about this separate state system, that over time I think more and more work of government, not just in Britain, but uh, globally, will become uh, much more electronic. And one of the, one of the reasons to, to, that works in that way, it is much faster, it can be a lot safer, it can happen in real time, you know, getting your information back, rather than having to wait for a document and not receiving it and then worrying. Why do we need a passport? Why do we need a driving license? And one of the things about it is that we, you know, the, the, there are yep. ways in which those documents are, can be very difficult to uh, uh, to, to falsify. And and it, it, even raising that hmm. is suggesting the duplicity of the vast majority of people. Of course, in amongst uh, the vast majority of Europeans, there might be some, you know, somebody who who tries to falsify a document. It's going to be of a very minimal nature. People are going to want to have a document so that they feel the comfort that that document gives them. And it's not to stop you having your number on the computer. To to documents are validified by having that comparison done, but it okay. gives the comfort to, to the person. Okay, well, let me, let me just, so then quickly just answer those questions. You need a, you asked about a passport and a driving licence. The reason that has to be documented is that's an international standard. That is an international standard. You, every country requires you to have a passport for travel, and because we are here, we're just setting a document standard for domestic use only, then it, you, the, the, you can have a legitimate debate about whether it can be just digital or not. I mean, the, you couldn't apply that clearly to passports and driving licences. Uh, but uh, I think that the part of also, we're maybe as, uh, we'll come on to a bit of the testing, is as we roll out the testing, now we're doing the, uh, the much larger test, uh, which will be open to, to many more people, is, that, is to get feedback, and hopefully you'll see that later when we have been getting feedback from the users, because ultimately what matters the most are the users and what they are comfortable with. And as we get that feedback, we have flexibility to change and adapt. I'm glad that you're, you're expressing the willingness to adapt once you've heard from people about what they really want. And what the downsides of giving someone a document is. I, I, we've given you lots of reasons why we think it's a good idea. Why is it a bad idea? Shall I answer that? Um, well, firstly, the Home Office down the years has issued many different kinds of letters, stamps, documents of all descriptions. And we've had a lot of feedback from employers and other people trying to check these documents that they don't recognise them. I mean, you know, the documents we gave out in the 1980s or the 90s, let alone the 1970s, it's very difficult to keep up to know whether these documents are genuine. So actually the feedback we've had from employers and others is that they, they would actually just like to go into a database. I mean, these days, for example, if you hire a car, the car hire firm, if they want to check your driving licence, you have a clean driving licence, you're given a reference number by gov.uk, and then the car hire firm goes into the DVLA database and checks your, uh, ch checks your driving record. Before you can pick up any hard car. Well, all, all, the, all you have to do in this case is go on gov.uk, and you can do this on your mobile phone, and take the reference number, put it in. It will all be there. I mean, don't forget, cards, you have to design them. You have to make them fraud-proof. They're quite expensive to produce to send out, they get lost, they have to be replaced. I mean, there's a whole industry around uh, secure documents. People will, when we give them the decision initially, they will have a letter from us or an email, I think, saying, thank you for application, it is successful, you have settled status. So they have that, but that, that won't count as a secure document. Also, in a database, I mean, you're not constrained by the size of a card as to the amount of details that you, you, you put on. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's much easier, and you can update it as, as circumstances change. You don't have to issue a new card to somebody. You can just update the database. So, um, 
I have to say, I mean, we think this is the way forward, and that's the feedback we've had from, from uh, users as well. Can I just ask a about the database? What is, can you remind me, what is the legal basis and status of the database? What uh, will be the rules on data sharing from that database? And, and how long, for instance, are you going to keep scanned, retained scanned documents if there is other, other evidence of, of this, residence which is supplied? Yeah. I'm not, I'm not um, this is different from retaining any evidence that the applicant gives us. This is simply, um, it will just give the person's name, biographic details, a photograph, and their status, and therefore their, their right to work will be in the UK. Um, it will be fully compliant with all the necessary uh, applicable data protection rules. And, and the person, the employer or whoever going into it will see no more than they need to see for the purpose of that inquiry. I'm not sure it's answer the question, but anyway, maybe I, 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 I can't pursue that now. But, um, you know, the, the, one of the things is you're going to have automatic checks against HMRC and DWP. Yeah. Will the applicant be able to see what data that you have used from HMRC and DWP to, to be able to, to contest it maybe. Maybe their documentation, their records were incomplete. So will the applicant know, for instance, if they're rejected, yes. will be able to say, well, I don't understand that because, you know, I've paid national insurance for 10 years or something. Will they be able to challenge? Yes. We, um, we say to them that we've consulted the HM, HMRC, your employment record via HMRC, and it shows that you have two years or three years or 10 years worth of uh, tax records, for example. Do you agree? I mean, we give them the chance to uh, contest. Thank you. Um, the Earl of Canal. Thank you, uh, Lord Chairman. And um, can I add my welcome to Home Secretary? Um, <clears throat> we move, in fact, to the settled status scheme, and uh, in particular the beta testing. And a very good report uh, appeared yesterday on the, on the beta 2 test, and thank you for that. Uh, just to set the scene for those who are watching, I know you'll be on top of the numbers yourself, but originally we were told that there would be 250,000 people going through the phase 2 testing. And the actual number that went through was just under 30,000. And um, the period that it ran was 1st of November to 21st of December last year. Now, on the 14th of January, which is the figures on which this report was based, um, we still had um, something like, or just over 9% of those applications had, hadn't been finalized in some way and were in 24 days at least after the end of the period were in a uh, some sort of holding pattern and so it wasn't really working and of course one is worried or I'm worried at least um, that uh, other <coughs> types of people will be more difficult because this was targeted to people who would, you would think would be a bit easier to fit through a system and there's evidence within the report of quite a lot of manual intervention um, going on with um, pop-up uh, application centres at hospitals and things where people were helping people go through and of course the again we were told before the idea was the system would be um, extremely online and there wouldn't have to be much manual intervention and so I come to some questions for you Home Secretary first is I mean how do you feel the system is is performing generally at the moment second is have you uh, done any assessment of the time it's taking for real human beings to go through the system and are you satisfied with that? And thirdly, um, could you say what the sort of target rate is for going through without human intervention? And within the report, uh, you refer to 81% of applications being processed within a week and is that in fact a, a target or are you happy with that or are you, you hoping to get a bit higher? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. And I mean, first of all, um, the when we said 250,000, that wasn't an estimate of at all of how many people may use it. That's just the eligible 
population because, because as a test it wasn't open to everyone because it might become overwhelmed. Um, and uh, so that was the edge population where we absolutely expected it to be some small proportion of that because participation is entirely voluntary because as you know the, the, the sort of full system uh, doesn't kick off until uh, March. So, uh, uh, but and as you say in terms of the number of people uh, using it was roughly about 10% uh, of that. Um, some uh, just under 30,000 uh, people actually used it and that was uh, so again we no one expected 250,000 it was just to talk about the eligible population versus we expect some small proportion of them to actually use it um, uh, because it's on an entirely voluntary basis. The, the purpose of this test especially compared to the, the, the first test the first beta 1 test was to then give us uh, more uh, insights into how it's going to work, especially um, the, uh, it, did we feel that our communications materials being properly understood, the guidance material. Um, we learned things about it uh, from the testing about the file size and uploading. So when you upload your photograph, and make sure that people, different people might have different uh, software. Uh, something about the technical standards and outage. You know, so if you start doing it and then you sort of go off because you get disrupted and go make a cup of tea, you come back, you don't necessarily want to have to start again. And then also how the automated checks were working with HMRC in particular and DWP, because again, we want to make it as quick and as responsive uh, as possible. And to then Put a bit more colour, and you alluded to some of the numbers. So we had just under thirty thousand uh, use the uh, uh, system, and, uh, uh, and and you asked me if I was uh, if I've been satisfied. With it. I have. Uh, I mean, for, from in terms of where we would expect to be at this point. Uh, we are satisfied. I caveat that uh, heavily that you know, there, there are millions of people uh, you know, eventually that would uh, use the system. And the, this, as you've uh, rightly pointed out as well, this is 30,000. It's more than the first test, but it's still a very uh, small proportion of the number of people that ultimately would use the system. And so there's a lot more work to be done, I think, in testing. But in terms of where we wanted to be at this phase, the results have been good. And to give a, a, a better sense of what I mean by good, over 90 percent of decisions uh, ha have been made as expected and uh, with no cases that were uh, refused. 70% were granted settled status of which 15% uh, were holding uh, already holding valid uh, permanent residence. 30% uh, were granted pre-settled status and 69% uh, of cases were decided within the processing time that we'd set a limit of up to three weeks with 81% in a week. You asked me whether uh, we would like to improve that 80% and 81% in, in a week, uh, we would. I mean, we'd like to be higher than that, but, but already at 80%, it's ex where we sort of expect it to be uh, at, at this stage. Um, and even we also found where people challenge. So we had a question earlier from, I think, from Baroness Ludford about can people challenge uh, the result? And we had for the first time we saw people doing that, which was good because there are always going to be some people that question uh, the result. And there were 11 uh, people that did out of the 30,000. And, um, and uh, there was an administrative review process. And uh, all of those, uh, in all 11 cases that uh, we, so there's 11 that, uh, that, that uh, did administrative review with the further 13 pending. And in the first 11 cases uh, that we resolved, that it was uh, the same question, which was, again taught us something. They were questioning whether, the, whether they should have a settled, pre -set, settled status versus pre-settled status. And we had to explain what the difference is, of course, if you've been here five years or less. And in each of those cases, it was understood uh, once it was explained. And then lastly, we also also check the uh, what's called the email uh, validation uh, process to make sure that we are uh, to test that we are uh, speaking to who we uh, who uh, the individuals identify themselves and uh, we also tested the ID process of when you put your passport um, uh, next to the phone and then it downloads the data uh, from your passport and we were very pleased with how that worked in fact we found that there were over 500 different types of Android based devices that were uh, uh, that were used uh, from 52 different device manufacturers and we were pleased with how it was able to cope with all, all, all the differences small supplemental questions if I might I mean, 9% sort of into the holding pattern and unresolved after at least 24 days. Um, if that was that percentage was the correct percentage for the full 3.5 million, you'd have over 300,000 complex cases. And I just wondered whether you felt you were adequately resourced for that. Second um, supplementary question, and um, just reading here from paragraph 18 of the, um, of the explainer, about um, the UK-EEA-EFTA separation agreement. 
And that paragraph says, and I quote, in the UK, EEA EFTA nationals and their families can apply for a resident status through the EU settlement scheme. And that, uh, this uh, explainer is dated 20th of December. And I think it would be very helpful if you could be clear today about whether that it is the case that um, EEA EFTA people, so that is Liechtenstein, Iceland, Norway, Switzerland, can today use the system um, and that that paragraph 18 of the explainer is, is accurate. Okay, I think it didn't well answer both of those. Um, firstly, uh, just on the, the question of the outstanding decision, so the 2,776 out of the 29,000, um, I mean, the reasons for that are given on page three uh, of the report under the heading the um, public private beta two performance data. Um, so, for example, um, we hadn't been able to finalise the decision in various cases because we were awaiting the submission of the passport where the chip checker hadn't, hadn't been used. And obviously some people were travelling over Christmas, I imagine, so they hadn't sent us in their passport. Or we were awaiting some, some further um, information from them. So it's, it's not as if the Home Office had all the information and there was just a backlog building up. In those cases, we were actually just waiting for that further information to come through. I mean, I think it's worth um, just, uh, just highlighting that 84% of those applying to us didn't need to send us any additional evidence. And many, many of those won't have sent us their passport either. And if you go back to where we were in 2016, after the referendum, you might recall we had a lot of complaints about our 85-page form. And, you know, when people, when people applied using that form, they sent us piles and piles of documentary evidence, pay slips and all. I, I've seen these uh, in, 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 in Liverpool. Uh, and, you know, 84% of people sent us absolutely nothing because it was all done online via HMRC. So, I mean, that, that is a very big step forward. I think for us, and quite quite a breakthrough for the Home Office, if if, if I may say so. Um, I mean, with the EFTA countries, um, can I just mention something? Um, we were given um, a notice that um, the Secretary of State only had an hour, and if you're prepared to go over a little bit, then 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 we can carry on with your answer to that question about um, EFTA and so on. Um, but I'm very anxious that we get to um, some of the questions that are coming up, um, particularly what's... Just write in with the... If you, can, if you can write uh, in response to okay. us about that. Yeah, we can would, do that. That would be really helpful because I'm, I'm yeah. most anxious that you answer some questions about, for example, no deal and what happens in, in those circumstances. Yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm saying to, to my colleagues, I'd like to, to, to move us along as quickly as we can. Mm -hmm. um, Lord Delacchia, you, you had a question. I think that it needn't necessarily take much time. Yes. If you... uh, on Secretary, can I ask you about the current trials on the settled status scheme that you have? within which is limbs that you've been consulting with the easy cases. What happens in relation to the community's engagement where people are unable to produce the type of documentation that would require to prove that they've been in this country for five years? I ask this particular question because one of the things that I've come across in my previous investigation on immigration control procedures, that officers have the habit of asking insatiable questions but to, put, 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 but to put very little faith in the answer they receive. And I think Windrush is an example of what had happened in the past. What I wanted to find out, what happens in the cases which are rejected? Is there an appeal machinery? Is there a way, method by which somebody other than your department would take a decision in relation to that individual? Yeah, so... Um yeah, first of all, one of the reasons we've um, uh, tried to set up a system that is absolutely we want it to be as quickly, as easy and as simple to use and as um, and, and sort of remove the need for you to send in documents and provide proof is, is precisely learning the lessons from the past and you've used uh, quite correctly the examples of say Windrush where we've seen now evidence through the lessons learned process through some of the work that the department has done, people that are called in, where people had been sending all sorts of documentation. You know, so, for example, we've seen examples of people said they had lived in the UK for many years, they've been working for many years, 
And, and sadly, in some parts of the department, the response was, well, you need to prove it. We're not speaking to HMRC. And I thought that was entirely the wrong attitude. And we're trying to change that. You know, I'm trying to uh, have, a, a, have a, a much more friendly uh, home office that is helping doing the work that's much easier for the home office to do. So that's why um, I think it's right that Glyn's highlighting this point, that with the testing so far, the biggest test we've done so far, over 80 per cent of people didn't have to send in a single documentation, piece of document, uh, because it was all either you know, so their ID was done electronically with their passport or just with the app, or uh, if it was uh, HMRC information, DWP information, we were able to connect directly with the system uh, in those departments and verify it ourselves without asking them to send in any proof. You've rightly asked the question, what happens when, um, if someone can't do that? So, for example, so there were some people who didn't have access to the app for ID check, and so they sent in their passports. And I think in most cases, we were able to send those passports back in a week. Mm -hmm. and on average, those passports being returned within a week. So they send it in and the document gets returned to them. And in some cases, uh, I mentioned a, a, an example earlier, uh, we found that people uh, did query the, the result, the decision. And in, in every case, we're able to resolve that. And they can call, the, they can call up uh, with that, or it can be done electronically. And uh, in, in cases where they, they want to take it further, I guess we can exchange uh, documents, but we're trying to keep that to an absolute minimum so that everything can be done electronically without them having a, feeling a need that they've got to send in uh, information. There is an appeals process. If it's a no-deal situation, it's a, it's a sort of UK-only process, as it, as it were. Uh, if it's, a, if it's a, 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 um, in a deal scenario under the deal that's been agreed in citizens' rights uh, part in the withdrawal agreement, it is, uh, there's, a, uh, I think, an ECJ involvement and oversight of that. Is that correct? The, 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 ECJ the, the withdrawal yeah. agreement, the citizens' rights chapter of the withdrawal agreement, which we've agreed with the EU, requires us to put in place a statutory right of appeal. So there will be a recourse to a tribunal and from there to the higher courts and ultimately to the European Court of Justice. One of those areas where, where, where the red line has had to become rather um, paler and, um, and European citizens will still have their right to ultimately uh, go to the European Court of Justice. Yes? If there's a, if there's a, if there's a conflict. If, if it's a deal situation, in a deal situation... No deal situation, then we're walking away from the whole bang shoot. But otherwise, you know... Yeah, sorry. Um, not, not. So there's uh, going to be specific on this. Not directly. The, is it, yeah. Arbitration process being created, but it, but if there's an issue of law, that it will have, it will be resolved at that higher level. Well, under the uh, withdrawal agreement, there are dispute resolution provisions, and um, from memory, I think they provide that a UK court, the, the Court of Appeal, for example may choose to refer a question to the European Court of Justice if they think a European issue of law, law is, is engaged, yeah. or, or, or they may not. That's up yeah. to them. If they do refer it, they, they are bound by what the ECJ says. Do you mean the Court of Appeal? Do you mean the Supreme Court? Um, I think the Court of Appeal can also make references um, to the European Court of Justice. But get bogged down, but I think you actually find that it's the High Court as well as the Court of Appeal. It's, it, there, can be, there can be a ref, reference if it's on an EU law matter. Um, uh, 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 but I really don't want us to spend time on that at this moment because we're really looking at a very specific thing. Um, I wanted Lord Pollock to have a chance of asking his question. Um, Lord Pollock. So I'm going to the no deal scenario, yeah. Home Secretary, uh, which seems to be gaining some... Uh, ground around the country. Uh, your policy paper on citizens' rights indicates that in the event of the No Deal, EU nationals in the UK would only have until 31st of December 2020 to apply for settled status. So what would happen to those individuals despite the very clear adverts that you have produced if they didn't apply in time? And are you confident that the IT system will be able to register some 3 million people in the time available? Look, we are, uh, we are, one of the reasons we're doing this testing is to build that confidence, but we are uh, confident that the, the system is designed uh, for the number of applications we expect. One of the reasons we, uh, so in a no-deal scenario, it's worth just keeping in mind that that would mean the sort of 
a cut-off date, as it were, for new arrivals would be the exit uh, date for March the 29th, as opposed to in a deal scenario, there would be more people that would use the scheme because it would continue during the implementation period. So in a no-deal scenario, uh, for that reason, there's probably less demand. On the, there's still high demand, but it's less demand than could have been in a, in a deal scenario, and that certainly helps uh, to cope with the overall demand for the scheme. Um, we would, it goes back, I think, to one of the, the, the very first question that we had about the sort of advertising and, and encouraging people uh, to apply. And it is right that, as has been said in the committee today, you need to get the right balance between sort of uh, the, uh, obviously welcoming everyone, but also sort of pressing gently that you must please apply. Because uh, the, it, it, the other thing to keep in mind, which is very relevant here, is that just going back, I mentioned earlier the immigration white paper. The immigration white paper is based on the fact that the new immigration system that we would have so after freedom of movement has ended would begin in January 2021. And by then you would really have to be in a situation where you can distinguish between sort of this cohort and the new arrivals that come after, uh, after the EU uh, exit date in a, in a no deal scenario. So we, we are um, confident there's enough time for people to register. I think you, one could also say that what happens if someone has just missed it and they, through no fault, let's say there's some really good reason. Look, we, um, I, as I said right at the start, I want everyone to stay. I want to make it as easy as possible. And we would just have to take a sensible, practical attitude to that. And, and, and make sure no one has missed out for any sort of uh, uh, sensible reason that they've had. And uh, uh, at the same time that we have to still press gently, uh, there has to be a cutoff period to, for everyone's own benefit and not least because as a country we can start a new immigration system on time. Okay. Lord Cromwell. Thank you, Secretary of State. Uh, nice to see you. Thank you for coming. Um, if there's no deal, as you've said yourself, there's no implementation period. Uh, and because of that, any EU citizens who come after the 29th of March are going to be outside the, the settled status scheme. So I'm thinking of those people who have perhaps been offered a job or a place at university that starts after that. What is their, and they're not here yet, what is their status going to be in UK law when they want to come to the UK to take up that opportunity? Well, it, 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 part of the answer really depends on um, any legislation that's passed between now and, uh, uh, so I'm assuming no deal scenario is what yes, you're asking no. about, between now and exit uh, date. And, uh, and, and specifically what I have in my mind is uh, the uh, immigration bill that's in front of uh, Parliament right now. As you know, the second reading of that was delayed in the House of Commons. We expect to bring it back uh, very shortly. But I, I, I don't want to um, prejudge what Parliament uh, does or doesn't do. Uh, but if, if that bill is passed, then uh, it, there's one answer, which is because that would allow to formally end freedom of movement. And if I just assume that uh, for a second, it also, though, means that we have to be very practical about you know, the, that, that, that period, that, let's call it a transition period, between uh, exit under no deal March the 29th and the start of a new immigration system. Uh, because as I have just alluded to, you won't be able to identify the difference between the uh, uh, European citizens already here and new arrivals that come after that. And so that's why I've already said that, uh, that you know, for example, in terms of employer checks, there'll be no different to what they do today, because you couldn't have a different system. And so there, there would be a transition system put in place that we will announce more details when we bring forward the second reading of the immigration bill in more detail, but the transition system will make sure that it takes full account of the fact that you won't be able to identify between the two cohorts and you need a proper system in place that allows you to transition from end of freedom of movement to a new immigration system. The, so if I may. Um, thank you. I mean, uh, the main thing I think at this stage is that you recognise there is a cohort of people there who are anxious and they will be relying on your sensible pragmatism that you, you referred to earlier to, to get them through this and uh, um, I'm sure they're very confident in it. Um, you also touched on employers. Can I just ask you, is it clear, because there's been some confusion around this, employers are required to check because there were some conflicting statements back in October and the summer on this. They are required to check. It's, yes, it's and let me be, it, it is uh, clear, but you're right to highlight it. It's another opportunity to make it even clearer if there is still an employer's claim. Because first of all, today, as we sit here today, employers need to check everyone's right to work. And that applies to a British citizen. You know, they need to check that, you know, if you say you're British and that's why you've got the right to work, they, they need to check and satisfy themselves for everyone. And that won't change. 
Uh, but what we uh, have made sure, and as I say, there'll be more specific details on this with the, alongside the second reading, is that we've made sure uh, that as far as EU citizens are concerned, employers won't have to do anything more than they do now because we want the smoothest possible transition process. And I think that's widely understood why that's necessary. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah. And, and my, and my um, I just want you to know I've just taken up a position where I was asked if I would bring my passport in. And so that's why I think this business, that it can all be done in other ways. The employers have got their system and they really want to see a document, honestly. Um, uh, Baroness Love. Home, Home Secretary, you talk about a, a practical scheme in what you'd call a transition, which is slightly confusing because you don't mean a transition in the, in the sense of the withdrawal agreement, but some, some kind of changeover, let's call it. Um, but if the immigration bill had passed, that abolishes the EEA regulations. So what is the legal status, not only of people who arrive after March 29th in a no-deal situation where we won't have a transitional implementation period, so because under, under the EU Withdrawal Act, those regulations are retained law, but the Immigration Bill, as I understand it, abolishes those regulations. So what is the legal status of people, but, and even for those who come before the 29th of March but haven't done their settled status application, on what legal basis will they be here after the 29th of March, both categories, if there is no deal? Yeah. So, uh, so today, under the current system, everyone, with the exception of EA, citizens requires leave to enter the UK. And as you say, if the immigration bill is passed and, and, and it's a no deal uh, situation, uh, then uh, that, the, the, because freedom of movement would be removed, uh, the, what we would do is uh, uh, everyone, uh, everyone then, including EA citizens, will require leave, but we are, would be in a position to have uh, deemed leave for EA, student, uh, EA citizens uh, with, with certain restrictions. Now, I won't go into what those uh, changes because it won't be because it won't be freedom of movement. It won't be exactly the same as it is today. But we have to be practical about how that what you've called, and I think it's a good word for it, that, that changeover from when you're moving from freedom of movement to a new immigration system. How you, we want, we will be setting out very shortly in detail how that would work. Uh, but what we want to, what we've already decided, what I can say, we want to make it as straightforward as possible and simple as what's for uh, EU citizens. So, for example, uh, today the only people that can use e gates are those that, in effect, already don't need leave to enter the UK. So that's UK citizens and EA citizens. But once we leave and it's no deal and the immigration bill has gone through, then uh, the, it, 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 without a, a change in that process, E EA uh, citizens wouldn't have been able to use the e-gates, so we want them to be able to keep entering the UK in the way that they do today through e-gates, and so we will be changing the rules and regulations around that to make sure that they can continue to use e-gates and enter the UK as they do today. In terms of uh, right to work, I've uh, answered part of the question on that, but in terms of what they, they will have leave, but in terms of what that entitles them to do and how long that leave will be, we'll be setting out uh, very shortly in much more detail. So do you mean new legislation or an SI or? Well, there's, there's, there's legislation, both primary legislation that's uh, in the uh, immigration bill and there will be, uh, there's SIs alongside that as well. Last but by no means least, Lord Judd. <laughs> um, Secretary, um, I found your answers today as the previous time you came extremely interesting. They do raise with me the question of the culture in the Home Office, and it's a very large organisation with very many people dispersed across the country, having to live in a real community where their friends and the media are not necessarily sympathetic to the welcoming culture that you want to create. How are you winning that battle to make sure that the Home Office, as a Home Office throughout the country, is welcoming and positive? And in this specific context, do you recognise that what is difficult to reconcile with your earlier statement is that it is, in fact, in operation, the whole scheme, one in which 
the administration lays down the rules and then is there to help with specifics on people who are playing by the rules. But what about this point that's been raised by several colleagues, that there are a lot of people who've given tremendous service to this country, but who are now elderly and vulnerable, are not in the technological society, don't understand the language of technology. And when I read this interesting report that you gave, and to which uh, 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 there has already been reference, and it is helpful, it is in the language of the technology world. Let me give you one, just there could be many others, but let me give you, apart from the old and the vulnerable, to give you one very specific example. Well, perhaps two. Uh, this is, what about children in care who don't have passports or access to original documentation? What about people who've been trafficked? Do you really have a proactive, positive approach of caseworkers going out and finding such people and helping them to understand what is now required of them and helping them to achieve what you want to achieve? Or how far does it depend upon their, in some way, connecting on themselves with the system rather than our going out in the welcoming spirit to make sure they're included. Thank yeah, you. yeah. Um, no, thank you. And uh, in answering that question, it's just worth remembering why uh, the, uh, we need to have uh, some kind of settlement scheme. And that is because, a yeah, simple fact, but it's a sort of the genesis of all this, is that because of freedom of movement, we don't know uh, who's here, you know, who's who's here, who's work. We just don't know. I mean, no part of it because it's freedom of movement, and you and no, and and there is a bit a bit of a difference with some of the other. Uh, if you look at other EU countries, some of them had have had registration schemes for all foreign workers for many many years, and uh, and that's why with uh, with more clarity, the, the the Spanish or the French can say you know, how many Brits they have. They often will know where they live and so forth. But we don't have, as you know, such a registration scheme. We've uh, honoured freedom of movement uh, to the fullest. So we don't. We, people came in, work, you know, with, with students or whatever. So there's no. So it, there's, it, there's a necessity to do this, and I think that's well understood. And uh, to answer your question, though, how we uh, approach that, it, it goes back right to start. We want to make it as straightforward and as simple as possible. I mean, I can guarantee to you, if we had not developed an electronic scheme that you can use on a device and touch your passport and not send in documents, as we've seen with the testing in over 80% of cases, but it was a documentation thing, you have to fill in forms, send them in, wait for them to come back. People were absolutely rightly complaining, saying, this is so bureaucratic, it's so difficult, my documents are getting lost. Equally, at the other end, there are some people that say, well, this is too electronic, this is uh, maybe it's a bit too simple. How can it be that I don't get a piece of paper back and things like that? And we understand that. But I think that it is the right approach to make it as simple, as straightforward as possible. But also what you said, and I'm glad you emphasized it and it came up earlier, there will be people that are not familiar with technology or there are other reasons they might be vulnerable. You've given another really good example, which we haven't touched on, maybe children living in care. Uh, European uh, children that, we, that, that would need help first, they're children, so they need um, adults or someone overseeing them, so we're working with local authorities. We have, you asked me, do we have um, confidence in that we are reaching out to these groups? It is absolutely part of what I mentioned earlier, uh, part of the whole ex uh, working with external stakeholders, local authorities, NGOs, charity groups, representatives of uh, European citizens, to listen to them to make sure that we leave no stone unturned in finding people. Traffic people. Absolutely. And traffic to victims of, of uh, crime, victims of modern slavery. Um, thankfully, the numbers aren't huge, but even one is too many, and we need to be able to make sure we're reaching out, even if it's just one or two people, and that we are doing that. So we are working with law enforcement, for example, and others, because they may be aware of people that might be vulnerable uh, as well. And also, we're not just relying on ourselves for this, because there will be others that know um, uh, how better to reach out. And so we want to, that's why we've got the £9 million programme of grants, which uh, and, and people can still, I think, up to February the 1st, I mean, they can keep applying for... 
for grants as a cut-off date, but as these organisations are applying for the grants, we are then allowing them to bring people uh, to us uh, as well. And, uh, and to reassure you, my, my job here is to make sure, again, and I said it at the start, and I don't think it can be said enough, you know, we, we owe a huge debt to every single European citizen that has come to our country and worked here. We've got to make sure that we are reaching out to them all to make it as easy and as straightforward as possible. Uh, we understand your c own personal commitment and goodwill on all this. But how on earth would that impasse have arrived yesterday with the announcement that there's to be a fee being cancelled on the day it becomes public knowledge? How exactly could that have happened if you won the battle for the overreigning, prevailing mores in the Harlem Office? Well, that's progress. In the, we managed to remove the fee. It's, uh, it's something that, uh, that we clearly wanted uh, to do. And uh, there, there is a cross-government process in making these decisions. But you know, rightly, the, the government, cross-government, has agreed on this. But I think that... It is another example. There needs to be more, and more work will continue to be done as we roll out the testing and learn from it. That uh, you know, I, I I can say this quite clearly now. I think having, if we had continued to have a fee, I think it would have become increasingly unjustifiable because you know these people are here. We shouldn't be asking them to pay something to stay here. I think that would have been wrong and the, the, the decision, the right decision has come out of government to, and, it, and it's much more welcoming to say of course you've got to go through some kind of process to register yourself for the reasons I've said but we shouldn't have been charging people for that. I know that your, your time is limited. There's one quick question here from uh, Baroness Shackleton. Please, please could I ask you to reconsider a piece of paper because you can't open a bank account without producing your original passport. You can't do many things without producing a document, a physical document. You can't open up. I can't see a client without seeing a passport and uh, somebody's ID as to where they live. So to have just something as a comfort, which won't cost the Home Office anything, but might be a comfort, can you reconsider a possibility that if they ask for it, they would give it? We will absolutely be listening to the feedback that we get from the people that matter most, and those are the one that this scheme is designed to, to, to work with, uh, but, and, and we keep, we're keeping many things under review. I, I, just, I just want to say some things finally. Um, I, I just wanted to ask you this question. I'm an employer. Um, somebody comes to me and I'm interested in employing them, and normally I would say, can I see your passport, and then photograph that page and keep it in my own documentations. Um, you're saying that um, um, I'd be able to type into a computer and they would be giving me their number and say I've got a settled status and I would find the Home Office site and I would type in the number. Yeah. What would come up? A photograph of the person that I'm seeking to employ? Is it, is it a photograph as well? Or? <coughs> yes, uh, it's gov.uk. Yeah. Um, it's gov.uk on the, that yeah. system. Okay, and then, yeah. and then what, what happens? Uh, you, I think I'm right in saying you will see a photograph of the relevant person and biographic details of them. Well, if you didn't have a photograph, um, um, it would be quite tricky, wouldn't it? Because there would be a, a kind of market in numbers. <laughs> so I would have thought there would have to be a photograph. Okay. Um, so so I, want to, I want to just finally say there are a number of questions that we haven't had time to pursue with you. Um, um, we've dealt with the ones that I think were most um, 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 urgent, but there are one or two that we would like to send to you in writing, and we'd be very grateful if um, perhaps Mr Williams um, could reply on, on those particular uh, Of course, we're very happy. And can I also um, offer that if, if any of the members of the committee were interested in seeing a demo of of the sort of application process, how you touch your passport to it and stuff. I mean, it's very quick. It can be done in you know, can 10 minutes. We're really happy to do that. such presentation, apart from what you did, your officials have done in the committee itself. And I found that very good. And I also found the commitment of the people doing it very impressive. But I think, still think that the yeah. question arose of whether the support to Home Office staff throughout the country <laughs> to become part of this attitude. Yeah, that's right. but, if, but if anyone wanted to see it who hasn't seen it, and thank you, Lord, for going that what you've just said, but we, I'm happy to arrange that through the committee. That would yeah. be very helpful. Um, Secretary of State, thank you for coming, and thank you for giving us your time, and it was very helpful indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The proceeding has ended.